And this is the story of the giant magicians, an Algonquin legend. There once was a man and his wife who lived far by the sea, far away from other people. They had many children and they were very poor. One day this couple were in a canoe far from land. There came a dense fog and they got lost. They heard a noise as of paddles and voices. It drew nearer. They saw dimly a monstrous canoe filled with giants who greeted the little folks like friends. Hey, my little brother, said the leader. Where are you going? I am lost in the fog, said the poor Indian very sadly. Ah, well, come with us to the camp, said the giant, who seemed to be a good fellow if there ever was one. Truly, ye will be treated, my small friends, for my father is chief, so please be in good cheer. And they, being much amazed at his gentleness, sat still in awe, while two of the giants, each putting a tip of his paddle under their bark, lifted them up and into their own boat. And truly, the giants seemed to be as much pleased with the little folk as a boy who would have found a flying squirrel. And as they drew near the beach, lo, they behold three wigwams high in the mountains, in size according to that of the giants. And coming to meet them was the chief, who was taller than all the rest. Ah, he cried, son, what have you there? Where did you pick up that little brother? No, my father, I found him lost in the fog. Well, bring him home to the lodge, my son. So the giant took the small canoe in the palm of his hand, the man and the wife sitting therein, and carried them home. Then they were taken into the wigwam, and the canoe was laid carefully in the eaves, but within easy reach, about a hundred and fifty yards from the ground. Then an abundant meal was set before them. But the benevolent hosts, mindful of their small size, did not give them more to eat than they would have needed for about ten years to come, and informed them that in a subdued whisper, which could hardly have been heard a hundred miles off, that his name was Oskun. Now it came to pass, a few days after, that a company of these well-grown people went hunting, and they returned, the guests must needs pity them, that they had no game in their land that it could answer for their size, for they came in with strings of such small affairs as two or three dozen caribou hanging on their belts. As a micmac would carry a string of squirrels and swinging one or two moose in their hands like small rabbits. Yet with these, many deer, bear, and beaver, they made up in the weight of their game what they lacked in size, and of what they had was generous. Now the giants became very fond of the small people it would not for the world what they should in any way come to any harm. And it came to pass that one morning the chief told them that they were to have a grand battle. Since they expected in three days to be attacked by the Chinu, therefore the Micmac saw that in all things it was even with the giants as with his own people at home, they having their troubles with the wicked, and the chiefs their share in being obliged to keep up their magic and know all that was going on in the world. Yes, for he would be a poor powwow and a necromancer worth nothing who could not foretell such a trifle as the day and the hour when the enemy would be upon them. Time, the Succamole and the Sagamore was forewarned and bade his little guests stop their ears and bind up their heads and roll themselves in many folds of dressed skins, lest they should hear the deadly war scream of the Chinu and with all their care they hardly survived it. But the second scream hurt them less, and after the third chief came to them with a cheerful contuance, and bade them arise and unpack thyselves, for the monster was slain. And through the four sons, with two other giants, had been sorely tired, yet they had conquered and won. But the sorrows of the good are never at an end, and so it was with these honest giants who were always being pestered with some kind of scurvy knave or others, who would not leave them in peace, for anon their chief announced that this time it was the Kukwes, a burly beastly villain, not two points better than his cousin the Chinu, was coming to play a rough murder with them. And verily, by this time the Micmac began to believe without batting an ace at it, 
that all of these tall people were like wolves who, meeting with nobody else, bite one another. So they were bound and bundled as before, and put in the bed like dolls. And they heard the horrible shout, then the moderate shout, and eventually the smaller shout, until the monster being interpreted meaningless that they had very well heard him at all. Then the warriors returning gave proof that they had indeed done something more than kick the wind, for they were covered with blood and their legs were stuck full of large pines, with there and there an oak and hemlock, for the fight had been in the forest, so that they had been in so much troubled as men would be with thistles, nestles, pine splinters, which is truly often a great trouble, but this was the least of their trial. For as their chief told them, the enemy had well nigh made Jack Drum's entertainment for them, and led them the devil's dance, had not one of them by good luck opened his eye for him with a rock, which drove it into his brain. And as it was, the chief's youngest son had been so mauled that coming home, he fell dead just before his father's door. Truly, this might have been deemed almost an accident in some families, but no. What a good thing it is to have an enchanter in the house, especially one who knows his business, as did the chief, who going out asked the young man why were they lying there, to which they replied it was because he was dead. The father bade him to rise and walk, which he did straight to the supper table, and ate none the less of it. The chief, thinking that perhaps his dear little people found life dull and devoid incident with him, asked them if they were aware of him. They with golden truth indeed answered that they had never seen so merry, but they were anxious as to their children at home. He answered that they indeed were right, so the next morning they might depart. So their canoe was reached down for them, and packed full of the finest furs and the best meats. When they were told, go ahead and get in. Then a small dog was put in, and this dog was solemnly charged that he should take the people home, while the people were told to paddle in the direction in which the dog should point. And the Micmac, he said, seven years hence you will be reminded of me. And then off they went. The man sat in the stern, his wife in the prow, and the dog in the middle of the canoe. The dog pointed, the Indian paddled, and the water was very smooth. They soon reached home. The children ran with joy to meet them. The dog, as joyful, ran to see the children, wagging his tail with great glee, just as if he had been like any other dog and not a fairy. For having made acquaintance, he without delay turned tail and trotted off for home again, running over the ocean surface as if it had been hard ice, which might indeed have once astonished the good man and his wife but they had of late days seen so many wonders that they were past marveling and it became normal. Now this Indian, who had in the past been always poor, seemed to have quite recovered from that complaint. When he let down his lines, the biggest fish bit, and all sprats were salmon. He prayed for goslings and got geese. Moose were as mice to him now. He had the best of all the land, with all the fatness thereof. So seven years passed away, and then as he slept, there came on to him divers dreams. And with them, he went back to the land of the giants and saw all those who had been so kind to him and had treated him like family. And yet again, he dreamed one night that he was standing by the wigwam near the sea, and that great well swam up to him and began to sing and that singing was the sweetest he had ever heard. Then he remembered. The giant had told him that he would think of him in seven years, and it came clearly before him what it all meant, and that he was given to have magical powers, and that he should become a giant. This he told his wife, who, not being learned in the lore, would feign now more nearly what kind of being he expected to be and whether a spirit or a man, or good or bad, which was indeed not easy to explain, nor is it clearly set down in the chronicles beyond this, that, whatever it might be, 
it was all for the best, and that there was a great deal of magic that was within. That day they saw a great shark cruising about in their bay, chasing fish, as they held for an evil omen, but soon after there came trotting towards them over at the sea, the same small dog who was their pilot from the land of the giants. So he, full of joy as before, and seeing them and the children, wagged his tail and danced about with glee, and then looked earnestly at the man as if to deliver some message. And to him the man said, It is well. In three years' time, I will make you a visit. I will look to the southwest. The dog licked his hands and ears, and gave the man a lick on the cheek, and went home as before over the sea, running over the water again, just as if it were ice. And when three years had passed, the Indian man entered his canoe and paddled without fear. He found his way back to the land of the giants. He saw the wigwam standing on the beach. The immense canoes were drawn up on the water's edge. From afar, he beheld the old giant coming down, smiling to welcome him. But he was alone. And when he had been welcomed and was in the wigwam, he learned that all the giant's sons were dead. Sadly, they had died three years before, when the shark, the great sorcerer, had been seen. They had gone and the old man had but lingered a little longer. They had made the magic change. They had departed, and he would soon join them in his own kingdom. But eerie, he went, he would leave their great inheritance, their magic to the man. Therewith, the giant bought out his son's clothes and bade the Indian to put them on. Truly, this was as if he had been asked to clothe himself with a great house, since the smallest fold in them would have been to him as a cavern. But he stepped in anyway, and as he did this he arose to a great size, filling the garments out until they fitted. He was now a giant, one of giant land. With the clothes came the wisdom, the power that the greatest and wisest of the olden time. He was indeed now a magic giant, and he had attained all the mystery. And there was nothing to break the light of the sun. Oh. Sometimes we believe we're lost when we're right on the right path. Eventually, even though things don't make sense at the time, they will eventually. And sometimes it takes time to get to that point. Understanding who we are and what we are and what we're meant for is something that may not come right away. But when it does, you'll know, because the great mystery will no longer be a mystery, and you'll know exactly what you were meant for. So I hope you have a wonderful day, and think on the lesson, because sometimes it's the magic that we feel that we'll never attain is something that's actually in our destiny. And if you enjoy the creepy and the unknown, Please feel free to subscribe to the other channel, Legends and Folklore. I'll leave it in the description and hope to see you there. Thanks again for listening.